your love. Um, but uh, Shane and I, our first year of marriage was difficult. I mean, we just did not know how to get along. We did not. And uh, I, I knew things were getting bad when a curler came flying at me. I thought, you know what? We're doing something wrong. Um, but, uh, and then things got really good right after our first anniversary. Like, we're like, oh man, we're, we're getting this. And then a couple months later, we were asked to go into full-time ministry. All right. And we were like you guys, like together now all the time. It got bad again. It got bad. So, <laughs> immediately got bad again. And uh, it's challenging to figure out how to work that dynamic um, when you're together all the time, especially in something that's as rigorous as ministry. And in ministry, you don't ever feel like you completed something. Like you're constantly, oh, we baptized this, this was awesome. Now you gotta think about now, how are we gonna strengthen them and keep them faithful? Like there's no like end to your job in the ministry. You know, I mow the lawn, not just for the workouts, but I mow the lawn so I can stare at it and say, I completed something. I'm not kidding you, you ask Sharon. I'm not kidding you. I do stuff to say I can complete it and then stare at it like admire it. I'll walk around the yard and my wife figured it out. Now she's like, Darren, your yard looks amazing. <laughs> So my wife is amazing. I'm married up, way up, and I'm grateful for that. And uh, God blinded her for a few months when she said yes. So, um, but guys, we want to talk today about uh, a profound mystery. And, uh, and uh, it is found in Ephesians 5. Um, so if we can go, it's, you know, how many times have you read this as a married couple? I mean, you've read it. I mean, let's face it. You probably read it so much that when I said it, you went, oh, man, again. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> again. But hopefully, we will be able to make a little more of a connection in that mystery where you can find something in there that you can really take with you and really help to continue to strengthen your marriage. What we've been encouraged by is that so many of you, from our conversations, are very happy in your marriages. That is amazing. And it's very encouraging, because that means you're working on it. You spend time thinking about it. You, you put work in. I mean, you, you're really going after it, and that's a great thing. And uh, don't take that for granted. And don't, don't, I mean, and be encouraged by that. It's a great thing to have a marriage that you're working on and that God is blessing. Amen. But in Ephesians 5, verse 22, it says this. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself after all. No one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. So, as many times as you've read this, and, and it talks about a profound mystery, I think for us what we hope to do is communicate more of the parable of our relationship with God. Because it's kind of what it is. It's kind of a parable for how it all works, how we work together, how our relationship with God works. It's kind of a parable. For, it's so much we can learn in the scripture. Just when you think you got it figured out, 
something else slaps you in the face. And that's a good thing for me because sometimes that's the only way I get the lesson is to have it slapped in my face. But there is also so much we can learn about our relationship with Jesus. There are two, they're very deeply interconnected. Amen. In great friendships, there are usually three aspects that are present. And this passage brings them to light. It's about relationship, role, and responsibility. All of those three are in there. Let's talk about relationship. All right. We'll get there. There we go. My phone was acting crazy. Sorry, Corey. It says, the, it's a relationship that makes us one flesh. We're inseparable. Think about it. It is impossible for one part of my body to go this direction and another part of my body to go that direction. Amen. They all work together. Unless there's some surgical thing or some really <laughs> brutal attack where one part of my body disappears. But it all moves together, right? Yeah. The whole thing moves together. We are inseparable. The whole body is one, right? And that sometimes becomes a struggle in a world that's sort of divided. We can struggle with that, but we are one, guys. That is the relationship that God has ordained for a husband and a wife. We're one. We move together. We are not separate. We are a one team. And it is the relationship that is ordained for a Christian in Jesus. We are one. Jesus is not going this way, and I'm thinking, no, I got a better idea. I'm going that way. Amen. We are one. Amen. It's a relationship that we willingly enter because of love. I married this woman because I really loved her and still love her. I wanted to be with her. I didn't want to be without her. She made my life better. She made my life complete. I entered that relationship knowing my eyes were open. I understood what I was walking into, mostly. But I knew whatever I was gonna find out later would still be worth me making this decision. Yeah. And that's the same way we enter the relationship with God. We enter it because we love him. We realize our lives are richer, fuller, and more importantly, complete and free of sin with him. So we enter that with our eyes open. We don't enter it reluctantly. We go all in. Amen. I remember realizing at first when I was studying that I was, I was separated from God. And the only thing I could think about is when are you going to let me get in that water? Yeah. I was not thinking, oh, well, let me think about it. <laughs> I was, when is this going to happen? I'm ready. For it to happen we want to be with him we're stronger and more complete with god than when we are not that's the relationship part of this profound mystery and you know another part of our relate of our friendship of our connection with god is roles and in any relationship they're going to be roles and in the role of our relationship with god Jesus is the head of the church. And it, again, in the parable, when we think about it, the, the husband is the head of the wife. So Jesus leads and guides the church because of his deep, selfless love for each person. Um, just as our husbands lead and guide our marriages because of their deep and selfless love for, for the wives, for us. Uh, the church submits to Christ because we trust him. We trust his love for us. We, we know that he has our best interest in mind. We see his sacrifice. We know that he would and actually has given him his life completely for us. And in the same way, we, as a wife, if you're a wife, we can willingly place ourselves, um, I'm sorry, we, as Christians, we willingly place ourselves under Jesus' authority. And in the same way, if we're wives, we can willingly uh, submit to our husbands because we do believe that they will give anything for us, and, uh, that, they, um, that they love us in every way. And, and, in do, and it's interesting. I, I, love the, I love Ephesians 5 because I love that it is just a way of looking at our relationship with God. And, um, and I think, you know, as a, a wife, in, you know, in doing this and in, in submitting to my husband, I can experience 
the beautiful and profound mystery uh, that God has given us to submit to Christ. Now the responsibility part. Jesus took the responsibility upon himself to cleanse the church and to make it his very own, to present it to himself as stainless and without blemish. That's the cup that Jesus is talking about in Gethsemane. He's talking about this cup. This is what he's talking about, the responsibility that he took upon himself to cleanse the church. The church's responsibility is to respect Jesus for that, to honor his name. In the same way, our wife's responsibility is to respect her husband. Now, respect for Jesus lets the world know that he is worthy of honor and is worthy of all of our hearts and the respect that we give him. He's worthy of our lives. That's what our role, give, presenting ourselves to Jesus, that's what our role says to the world. Now, my wife's respect for me lets the world know that I am a man worthy of honor and respect. It's a great thing when, because of how your wife loves you, that you are a man worthy, seen as a man worthy of honor and respect. Wives, you have that kind of power. Amen. That is an amazing power you have. That, you can, that your husband is presented as this person because of how you treat him. And guys, when we take that responsibility of doing all we can to make sure that our wife is presented in a way that is amazing, this blameless, stainless person, then what does that do? Then she is treated with respect and honor because of how Amen. we treat our wives. With this parable of marriage is an example of our relationship with God, our relationship with Jesus. And what we're going to do is look at some studies that kind of display that, how the marriage relationship mirrors the relationship we have with Jesus. Right. You ready for that? Yeah. All right, so we're going to get going here, and Sharon's going to start us. Okay, right, and again, as we're doing this, we, what we did is we looked up some, you know, different studies, different things that people have, have said, uh, experts have said about, uh, about the marriage relationship. And again, thinking of that in a marriage, but really, what we're really talking about is our relationship with God. So we're going to yep. take some marriage concepts and, and really talk about so what we're talking about today is Jesus, is our relationship with God. Amen. But uh, the first thing, the first thing um, is, do you kiss or hug or maybe even hold hands with your partner in public? So studies show that public... I've been course, watching you guys. <laughs> whole weekend, yes, been watching you, The answer to that is, yes, you do. We, we see that. Okay. But um, according to studies, public, debase, public displays of affection are great for a relationship. Uh, in one study, 68% of the couples who don't uh, who keep hands off of each other in public report that they, they are unhappy in their relationship. They're unhappy in their marriage. Now, interestingly, 73% of the people who reported being happy in their marriage also reported that they, that they indulge in PDA, in public displays of affection. Interesting, right? So how does this uh, apply to our relationship with God? Uh, do I, I have to think to myself, do I publicly display my love for God? Maybe it's as simple as, you know, when I'm, I'm out to eat, I, I'm not ashamed maybe to pray, you know, to show, to let the world know that I love Jesus. You know, is it, what about my, my expressions, what I talk about, what... Uh, do I let people know, again, that I am, I am not ashamed to show that I love Jesus? Because, again, when in our relationships with one another, when we do show that we love each other, it shows our, our, um, a level of happiness in our marriage. All right, let's keep going through these studies. All right. Have you given up an important part of yourself to keep your relationship together? Interesting, 30%, almost 30% of people in a relationship in a year or less said that, no. They said they haven't really given up some, a significant part of the relationship, of themselves to the relationship. Compared to about 50% of people in a relationship for 25 years or more, they have given up 
a significant part of themselves for their relationship. The fact is long lasting committed relationships do require sacrifice. Yeah. They simply do. If your goal in your marriage is just to be happy, then mm, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. Yeah. You gotta give a part of yourself. And we're not talking about compromise, we're talking about collaboration. We're talking about just both of us sacrificing for the betterment of our marriage. Similarly, as have you given up an important part of yourself for your relationship with God? Have you done that? If I'm more concerned about my comfort, my ease and happiness with loving God, then my relationship with God will not last. Right. It has to be something that I give myself, a part of myself up for, a significant part of myself, all of myself. The same in my marriage. When I give up all of myself so that this can work, then it works. And it lasts now for 32 plus years. Almost 33 in March. But if I don't give up myself, then my relationship with her won't work and definitely my relationship with God won't work. And the third thing um, that studies have shown is in the question is how often do you hold hands with your partner? Now studies have shown that holding hands with someone relieves stress and produces a calmness and peace in difficult situations. In fact, a 2006 study from the University of Virginia, so you know, it kind of gets close to home, right? In that study, six, they studied 16 um, uh, married couples, or married women, I'm sorry, they had 16 married women, and they subjected them, and I have to say this, I used to, I would, talked about this before and I always said okay they gave them a mild shock and I thought that is so weird they were giving people an electrical shock so I actually went back you know the other day I thought let me just double check and make sure I'm not telling things that are incorrect and it was incorrect so they they don't actually give the women a an electrical shock they threaten to give the women an electrical shock does that make sense okay so they like you know wire you know put wires on them and said okay we're gonna give you a shock so so the women were afraid, they were, they were scared, right? So they, uh, they threatened to give these women an, an electrical shock. And, uh, and so the women were divided, they had three different things uh, happen to each woman. Uh, on what, the first time they were threatened, or one time they are hold their, they have nobody there with them. You know, they're not holding anyone's hand. Then they hold a stranger's hand, and then they can hold their husband's hand. And meanwhile, they're, they're um, hooked up to a, a functional MRI, whatever that may be. So, uh, so they have this going on, but what they found out is when the woman was holding her husband's hand, it, there, was, uh, there was just a, a pronounced uh, effect of calmness. You know, they checked their heart rates, they checked their brain wave, the brain, pattern, the brain pattern was very calm when the woman was able to hold her husband's hand. And they said, um, uh, the, the brain region associated with pain, it was similar to the effect brought about by a pain relieving drug. So basically holding for the wife to hold her husband's hand was just like giving her a Tylenol or, or giving her some kind of medication. That's the kind of effect it had. You know, as I think about, um, oh, actually another study showed that, um, that holding hands decreased the heart attack risk and men, so that's another thing. But uh, yeah, I hold her hand a lot. <laughs> I hold her hand all the time. <laughs> but you know, again, how does that relation relate to our relationship with God? You know, we can't physically hold Jesus' hand, but we can spiritually hold His hand. When we are threatened by difficult situations, when we are scared, when we feel like I don't know what to do, I, you know, we can. Where do we go? But holding Jesus' hand spiritually, holding our Bibles, reading what God's Word says, allowing God to comfort us can, can have the same kind of effect. And I think it has impact on the people around you. We were walking into Walmart late one night, and it's the only time I'll go to Walmart near us because it's always very crowded. But we were walking in there, and we were holding hands in the parking lot and walking into Walmart, and we were laughing and talking, and at about halfway into the store, someone tapped me on the shoulder. Thought, okay, Walmart late at night tapping on the shoulder. <laughs> and it was a brother. And he and his wife were there. And uh, 
And they looked and they said, oh, it's good to see you guys. They said, you know what? We saw this couple walking through the parking lot holding hands and we thought, what a cute couple that is. And then as we walked in, we realized it was you guys. That was so encouraging for us, is what they said. And you'd be amazed at how much the little things you do in your marriage matter to people around you. And especially as one of their elders in their ministry, um, it meant a lot to them to know that after all these years of marriage, we still feel that way about one another. Now, here's the next one. How frequently do you tell your partner you love him or her? Now, for some of you, this is an interesting one because you're waiting how this is gonna go because of what I shared earlier. I grew up in a family that we never said those three words. We literally, my mom is now a disciple, has been a disciple for 20 plus years. And now it's interesting. My mom is a disciple. My grandmother was a disciple, passed away as a disciple at 97. At one point, there were four generations of us that were disciples, which was very, very powerful, you know, to be around that. And, uh, but um, even now, after my mom being a disciple all those years, we still find it awkward to say to one another, I love you. This she just, tells me all the time. Yes. <laughs> but she can't tell me. Like, what is that? Maybe she loves me more. I don't know. <laughs> she definitely does. There's no doubt about it. She definitely loves sharing more. I'm totally good with that. In another study among married couples who ranked their marriage as, as the happiest, 85% of them say those three words at least once a week. 85% of that couples that consider themselves happy say I love you to one another at least once a week. That's a big thing. Now, it's oxygen for the relationship, says one psychologist. That telling somebody you love them feeds the relationship, it keeps it alive, it reinforces your feelings, and it helps remind you that you love one another. It just helps remind you how you feel about one another. Expressing love can make you more positive and empathetic and compassionate for one another. Just saying those three words. Now, I, Sharon would tell me when we first got married all the time, Darren, why don't you tell me you love me? I literally one time said in our first year, but I married you, didn't I? You think, no, that's a joke people tell. No, I said it. It just wasn't a word that came out. It just wasn't a word that was natural to me. Now, I wind up waking up catching myself saying it. Like if I've fallen asleep, I'll, I'll, I'll wake up and say, did I just say I love you? <laughs> because it's something that means a lot to me. Now, it doesn't mean the same thing to me, her telling me that she is proud of me or encouraged me, now that floats my boat, but for her it means so much. The question is, how often do we tell Jesus, I love you? Yeah. Just those simple words, I love you. Not, God, let's talk, God, I need some help. God, I wanna pray to you, you're awesome. All of that is, all that is amazing. All that is what God wants. But just simply, and sometimes for no apparent reason, just saying, I love you, Jesus. Just saying. Amen. And uh, the next question to ask ourselves is, how often do you kiss passionately? Okay. And again, another study. In another study, 74% of the couples who reported being the happiest uh, also exchange passionate kisses at least once a week. Now I was like, once a week, come on people. But uh, <laughs> that's the study. I don't write the studies, I just read the studies and that's what they're saying. But, uh, but yeah, of a passionate times, times when we express our affection to one another. And you know, again, thinking about my relationship with God, I have to ask how often do I passionately express my emotions to Jesus? How often do I express my emotions to God? Do do I praise him with passion? Uh, you know, whatever that may mean. I mean, we all have different ways of, of expressing our 
expressing our passion, whether it's singing, whether it's raising our arms, whether it's falling on our knees, whether it's just laying on the floor with our hands spread out, whatever it is, just being able to passionately express our love for God. Because again, the, the parable of the marriage and the relationship with God is, is, you know, that's part of it, is being able to passionately um, express our love to God. Okay, that went good because one time we did that point and the group got so loud and rowdy trying to make us passionately kiss each other that they would not stop until we did. But you guys didn't do that. You're more awesome than they are. And because, no, because, because, no, no. before I was so rudely interrupted is that I wound up doing the rest of the lesson with lipstick on my lip, which is now happening again. <laughs> the next point, how much do you continually learn and get to know your partner better? A recent study by the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School revealed the importance of retaining a genuine sense of interest, intrigue, and curiosity about your spouse. In a study, couples watch videos of themselves arguing. I hope we never do that study. <laughs> and, uh, and afterwards, each person was asked what the partner was thinking. Interestingly, the longer they had been together, the worse they actually were guessing because they thought they already knew what they, their partner was thinking during the argument. When explaining the results of the study, a Harvard professor of psychiatry said, what keeps love alive is being able to recognize that you don't really know your partner and perfectly, perfectly and are still being curious about the relationship because you want to know more. We keep changing. What Sharon may have liked or was interested in two years ago may not be the same thing she liked to was or interested in right now. So I have to keep looking. In the same way, do we think we know everything we need to know about our relationship with God? Do we think we've got it all figured out? Because sometimes I catch myself there without knowing it. Hey, yeah, I know what to do here. I had no clue what to do there. I think I know where I am. I, I tell you what, the last two plus years of this pandemic has revealed so much more in me that I didn't know about myself. So much more. And I think my relationship with God has deepened and gotten more broad. And, and I, there's more, the scriptures that I read all the time are now completely new to me Amen. in so many ways. Amen. And I think that's important for us to continue in our relationship with God. The marriage relationship reflects our relationship between the church and Christ. What does your marriage reflect? And these are just questions. I'm not saying them to be condescending or challenging. These are just questions for us to ask ourselves. Because if we keep questioning, what it means is we're still curious. We're still interested, not only in, in our marriage, but in our relationship with God. I love learning more about Sharon. There are things sometimes she does where I go, whoa, I didn't know she could do that. I mean, honestly, it's just, I love learning these amazing things about my wife. And more so, I love learning new amazing things about God. We, I just preached two weeks on Haggai, one and two. And all of the time I was studying it, there was stuff coming out of it I had never, ever paid attention to. But the study of it was so exciting. I, I remember thinking, I was studying it late at night. I just, okay, Sharon's asleep. Okay, I can study it again. <laughs> just because it just was so rich and what it had in it. And it was so applicable to me at this point in our society. It really, really was. So let's continue to get to know each other. Let's continue to enjoy our marriage relationship. Amen. And let's continue to grow and enjoy our relationship with God. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for having us here.